Great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate you taking the time in the afternoon to, to join this. Uh, so the topic of this, when we were working through it with the folks from Twilio, is you know, to, to have, take a different perspective is to talk about uh, not really just our service, which I will talk about a little bit because it's sort of a word for my sponsor, but uh, to talk about how we got there, which is really uh, the service we run today, w of which Twilio is a part for the voice component, um, is really the product of two pre precursor services that uh, we launched and, and that failed. One spectacularly and one not, not so spectacularly. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have, have taken something to commercial uh, launch and had customers on it and had to go through that process of writing it up and then decommissioning it when you still had paying users. But uh, it's, a, it's a, one of those processes you learn a tremendous amount from. Uh, and those learnings built what is today what's called Life Size Cloud. Uh, so I'm going to do a couple things. One, take you through what it is. Two, take you through a couple different buckets of, of what we learned and applied to the service, uh, of which, frankly, the voice aspects that we leverage from Twilio and, and other things we might leverage in the future based on some announcements today um, are, are a big part. And then we'll do some demos, because I think that's always the fun part. And then we'll take questions. So who are we? Uh, LifeSize is a company uh, based in Austin, Texas. We've got about 350 employees. Uh, our, our business today is really increasingly built around our cloud service and connected devices for the conference room. So these are video conferencing systems that are paired to the cloud service, as well as PC, Mac, iOS, Android, and, and browser-based WebRTC clients. Really, when you think about what we're becoming as a company, because we started off as a embedded device, you know, hardware system company and software, software infrastructure company, is much more like, in many ways, a video PBX in a way. You now, directories, presence, um, you know, call escalation, bridging, extending out to a variety of devices in a seamless way. But it's quite a bit different than what you might think of if you think of Cisco Call Manager or something like that. Uh, I use that just as an analogy of it's a, connected, it's a connected experience. It's not what traditionally video conferencing has been where you kind of go in and put in IP addresses and work through NAT and firewall traversal and all that garbage. That, that's sort of you know, not part of the, uh, the equation in this. So we're, we're selling cloud today, act, or we've sold in 40 countries. We have about 1,300 paying customers, about 40,000 users. We sell to enterprises, everybody from you know, customers with tens or hundreds of thousands of employees down to SMBs that might have 50 to 100 employees. Uh, we're not selling to individual users or consumers. That's one of our lessons learned uh, that we'll talk about. So it's, it's very much an enterprise sale model of a SaaS plus connected device strategy, which is somewhat different. And this is our third try, so <laughs> we got to get it right. Uh, we've been doing really well. I mean, we, we're getting a lot of leading brands, including many in the Bay Area, where we have a strong, a strong base that are buying. And they're buying because it's different. It's not just a meet me service. It's not just a video conferencing endpoint. It's not just a WebRTC app. It's a connected combination of all these things that makes it really easy for users. And so when we survey our customers about what they like, the number one thing they say is it's just really, really easy and intuitive for users because it's a consistent experience across all their device types. They can call people as well as rooms. And we cover a large range of bases in terms of functionality. So what are we trying to be? You know, we're trying to be a great video conferencing network or service uh, with a unique attribute around connected devices in the meeting room, which is our heritage, on a great global network. And that's IBM software. And we'll talk about that as we go. So what do we do? Um, we take a really user-centric approach. So video conferencing traditionally has been something that IT managers really tightly control because it's expensive and it's complex. I don't know how many of you guys have used traditional video conferencing. Cisco, Polycom, Red Vision, Avaya, Today, Us, Huawei, anybody? Some of you have to have. Yeah, You wouldn't be in the room if you hadn't. Um, most people's impressions of it are not positive. I've been at LifeSize seven years. I joined when we were a Series D startup. And uh, my, every experience I'd had with video conferencing prior, prior to coming in for my interview was horrible. And I kind of came in as a favor to a board member who's like, you got to go meet the CEO. Um, but it's just a different deal. And we have a very different philosophy. And, and ease of use and high, the highest quality of the video has always been a big part of it. But now what's happening with the technologies that are available that weren't available with our precursor services is you can just extend the capability to so many more people at a scale and a rate that is just almost inconceivable. So the vision I had for the service we have today I tried to launch in the beginning of 2010 with spectacularly <laughs> bad results. <laughs> and mainly it's because a lot of the technologies we needed and a lot of the, the IAS and PAS players didn't exist or they were in their own infancy. Um, so the things we do today that make it easy and consistent um, and that converges the functionality of other services, you know, today we can do, whereas in the past we really couldn't. 
We bring to this a range of devices for the conference room, although we can bring in third-party devices like Polycoms and Cisco's too. We're fully interoperable from everything, you know, voice, WebRTC in the browser, everything. But we also treat these kind of like a Fitbit or a Nest. You pair them very simply. I could do it with my smartphone. Um, it takes about a minute. I add it to the account in the conference room, and then it's pushed its directory. It's pushed its virtual meeting rooms. Its calls can just escalate. Um, if I had one registered to me in a personal office, it would be an extension of me. So it would ring when people called me, just like my phone, my iPhone would ring, just like my PC or Mac would ring. They're all me, right? Very, very simple for users. And we have a range for different sizes from lecture halls and boardrooms on down. This is a big part of why people buy us, because we have a heritage in embedded design, and this is really, really hard to do. And a lot of folks today will do different things. They'll build their own with a webcam and a PC. From an ease of use and a power of functionality standpoint, there's a big difference between the two. We cover a range of price points um, from a couple thousand dollars up to about 10, and uh, this is one of the things customers like most. All right, so well, lesson one. So how many of you built, well, I didn't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you built something and had to then take it apart and explain to the customers why you were taking it apart? Anybody but Chip and me? Oh, a couple of you, yeah, four of us. It's, it's one of those things you're glad you learned from, but I imagine but you never ever want to have to do again. And I've done it twice. Once, once from a service we bought and once from a service that I was responsible for us building. Uh, some of you may have been customers of it actually. Um, but you apply it to what you do next. Well, one learning we had was data center network. And I see this with many of my competitors in this space today. We tried to do it all ourselves, And this was a colossal, colossal mistake. Um, folks like Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Microsoft, IBM Software, they weren't anywhere, if, they didn't have the capabilities they have today by a long measure five years ago or even six when we were planning. It wasn't even feasible. So we were in the world of, you know, coloing in Equinix or other data centers and, and having our IT organization manage things remotely, um, you know, based on an internal SLA. And it was just terrible. I mean, to say it was terrible was a vast understatement. The data centers were connected on the public internet. You know, we had an, we had an unplanned outage every month for our first seven months of the last service. I mean, and I'm not talking about five seconds or 15 seconds. I'm talking 30 minutes to two hours during the US business day. Um, I mean, we, it was just awful. And it wasn't predictive because sometimes it was the data center provider. Sometimes it was a guy you know, with a backhoe cutting the trench in the back of one of the data centers and it didn't fail over. Sometimes it's the IT guy screwed up and took down the sand and there, there you go. Um, so we, we just completely have abandoned that approach and looked at who does this well? Because that's not us, right? Running data centers and running colos is not the job of any rational SaaS provider. If you're in that business today, I would tell you, and I hope none of you are, don't do it. Um, very few do, but there are some out there in my, in my space who I compete with who are. They're not on AWS. They're not on software. They're not on Google. They're doing their own colos. And that's why they have the outages they have. Um, so we use best-in-class providers. We run today on AWS for all of our front-end directory services. Um, and for some other networking elements. And then we run, we'll be running, uh, as we add recording and, and streaming to the service, we'll be using Amazon CloudFront for that. Everything else we run on, on IBM software, and really two reasons for that. One, there's some aspects of what we do around video bridging, even though it's software-based, that, that IBM has a unique capability around bare metal that allows us to build from the ground up if we want to, that's really appealing. The second one is, you know, by many measures, they're the largest private network in the world. I mean, they run a 2,000 gigabit uh, dark fiber network around the world that's just theirs, connecting their 23 POPs in their data centers. It's ridiculous. When we lit up um, a year ago, we launched, it'll be a year ago tomorrow, um, you know, we started making calls after we exited the beta where production customers were coming in for trials, because we do free trials. And we couldn't explain why the call quality was better than we'd ever seen before. And the biggest difference was, you know, you're jumping from, you know, Melbourne, or at the time, I guess it would have been, Singapore to a pop in Singapore over a private network to Dallas to us in Austin and, and you just have so little public internet connectivity the call quality was massively better so you know we, we got a lot of benefits from running with professionals and great networks uh, but this is one of our lessons is know what you do well and know what you don't do well and don't 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 show your pride on the stuff you don't do well and certainly running running the network and running the data centers is not what we do well our DevOps team does all the application aspects to it but but beyond that we leave it to the guys who do it extremely well. Second one, go to market model. So in our Gen 1 services, we tried a lot of different things. We had direct e-commerce. Uh, we had phone-based e-commerce. 
And then we also had some reseller-based sales. Our history as a company, because we sold devices and software on-premise, was primarily reseller-based. That's the heritage of the video conferencing industry. And we still do a great deal of our business through resellers, especially internationally, um, where almost half our business is outside North America. Um, the, the, the surprising thing as we led into this, and we still hear it today, is no one would ever buy a service like this through a reseller. And what we found is that's just not true. Um, the bigger the deal, and I'm not talking about multi-million dollar deals, I'm talking about customers who might be spending a hundred grand. Um, in this market still, resellers in, all, in many cases bring a great deal of expertise. And customers haven't quite gotten comfortable in many cases with, um, with the, uh, the purchase process. Now in another year or two that may change, but uh, what we see today is you know, giving customers choice. We certainly have direct. But we really stepped back and said, if our partners can add value, let's give them ways to do so and embrace that aspect of it. Certainly, people who have integration capability, who can do the hardware device side well, bring a lot of value. Uh, but one of the things I'd tell you is, you know, there's sort of a group think that happens to all of us as we do services or we do products because this is the way everybody else does it. And frankly, it's just, it's just bullshit. I mean, you don't know what the answer is about what your customer wants or how they want to buy until you ask them. And looking at what your peers do, which we fall trapped to, from time to time is, like, is the absolute worst thing you can do, because all you do is just look like them. You, 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 you replicate all their good aspects, but you really replicate all their bad aspects, because it's harder to find out what they do well. You gotta talk to the customer, and if they wanna buy through their cousin, the reseller, let them buy through their cousin, the reseller. It costs you some points, but so what? Um, you know, an unusual thing for somebody with a SaaS business to say, but it, you know, do what makes the customer happy, including how you sell to them. Service reach. So this is the third one, and this is really where Twilio is a big part of what we do. We, we fell trapped to the, the great product and developer, you know, product guy and, and engineering leader trap in our Gen 1 services, both of them, which was any time we wanted to build something, our developers had to build it. It didn't matter what it was. We could have been saying, you know, we're going to have emoticons on our service. We would have had to go off and, you know, do that. Font kits. We would have, you know, we would have had to go build fonts because, God forbid, we leverage somebody else's technology. That's just bad. And if we did leverage someone else's, else's technology, it was shit and we had to redo it, you know, over and over and over. Um, and, you know, that's just a bias. Every, if you have good developers, they always think they're the best and you want that. But you also have to recognize there are things you have to firewall off that you just don't do well. And for us, that was a big learning from the Gen 1 services because we were always constrained. It always slowed us down. It frustrated customers. You know, we, we, we've been extremely disciplined about taking a lean, minimum viable product approach to, to, an, to uh, the hairy edge as we brought this thing to market and then adding on top of it, and I'm a big advocate of that. But we couldn't have gone anywhere near as fast as we are going without leveraging technology partners rather than trying to do it ourselves. So one, uh, Sahi talked about it yesterday and in the, other, in the sessions at the other site, Fort Mason, there was a lot of talks. WebRTC is huge. This, WebRTC didn't exist five years ago. It was a dream, right? The, the ability of this, and I'll show you in a minute, to to bring people into calls and make these services real is massive. And it's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and it's just really in its infancy, in my opinion, of what it can do. PSTN Voice, you know, which we leverage from Twilio, that's another one. I mean, you know, we could have gone to GenBand and bought equipment and licensed lines and, you know, whatever. But in the middle, we do use one other provider besides Twilio in some markets where Twilio doesn't have presence yet for local numbers. But I mean, from day of launch to today, we have local dial-in numbers for audio conferencing into our service in 57 countries. Um, to do that myself, it would have taken five years. I never would have done it. The ROI wouldn't be there. Um, it's just amazing what you can do. And the cost is, is very reasonable. And this sounds like a Twilio advertisement, but it's, I don't mean it that way. For a, for a business class service like us, you know, an enterprise targeted service, adding features your customers want at some cost is just an easy value proposition. So as Twilio adds other services, as Harry and I were talking about today. You know, if there are bolt-ons that we don't have to go do that meet a customer need, great. You know, uh, we're open to it. Um, we chip. We work with Tip Chip from Temesis on you know an IE plugin for the same reason, right? They're good at doing something that we don't want to be good at doing, um, and that's great. You know, so uh, the one thing I would tell you, and this is really hard in a technology organization and as a product leader, is you've got to decide what you're not going to do, and you've got to deal with pissed-off developers who want to do it anyway. And you have to draw boundaries and go get best in class stuff from people who are better at it than you are. And that's really hard. I would say that is one of the hardest parts of my job every day. Because every time I do it, I get yelled at by my best developers who are like, why don't we get to play with the new toys? <laughs> it's like, you got to play with the toys we're good at, good at making successful. Okay, so demo time, which is always the fun time. 
If it fails, it's all my fault. Uh, well, this will probably be determined by how good the network is. So let me show you what the, what the service looks like. This is the Mac client. Um, I've got one on my phone too, which I can just show you mirrored real quick. It's exactly the same thing. If you want to do a conference room with one of our paired systems, you'd see exactly the same thing. So this is the Mac client over here. Uh, the, PC, the, PC, the Mac client's in the background, the iPhone's in the front. Same idea, you see directories, you see meetings, you see recents, you see chats, and you see who's available, presence, those kind of things. I'm gonna turn off the phone client here just because it gets confusing. So I come in and I've got my favorites, I've got my meetings, these are virtual meeting rooms that I can call into. I can have you know, dozens of sites coming in over video or voice. Uh, I can share data um, easily, and I'll show you that in a second. I've got a presence-enabled directory. Ours has about 400 in it. We've got customers with thousands and thousands in their directories. Um, I can, you know, Bobby runs software for us. I could call him, I could you know, do a direct voice call, I could chat with him. I won't do that because it'll throw him off. It's only his third day. But, uh, you know, and then I can, I can go into to histories and other things. It's exactly the same experience whether you're on your phone or you're on your PC or your Mac or you're in a conference room on one of our devices. It's a little bit different if you just do an IP dial in from a third party system like a Polycom or a Cisco with Interop, but the same basic capabilities are there, video, voice, data. Um, and the idea being, you know, from an IT standpoint, they train users once and then users just go. It's very, very simple and that's why people like it. So I'm gonna do two sets of calls. <coughs> one will be to call my team. Um, so I'm gonna show you, dynamically our calls just build. So you can do a meet me model and say, everybody meet me in my virtual meeting room like this MH Twilio demo. Or you can just make and receive calls and it, and it grows. So let's give it a shot. First up I think is Farzana, or no, yeah, hi Far. Hi. Welcome to the Twilio event. You can see me, not them. We'll, okay. We'll add no some worries. more people. Uh, we'll call Jeremy. So you're gonna see it just it just builds. Somebody's not gonna be there. They're supposed to be there, but they're not. Someone's in a no show. Okay, there's Jeremy. Hi. We'll add Rafi. And they could do the same thing. So it's totally dynamic. So, you know, one of you guys could call into this and you just add and then it'd build. Or I could call you and it'd add and build. Or you could call anybody on the on the, the line. It's totally dynamic. So we try to make it completely there's Rafi. We try to make it very much democratic and user-based. You know, we, we, it's not the typical video conferencing where it's tightly IT controlled. This is designed where users have almost complete freedom. So the buyer in the organization sets the bounty box of here's our account, here's what we're entitled to. But beyond that, users have free reign unless IT actively goes in and turns off function. So it's really designed to be, Rafi, you're gonna make people sick. You're walking through the office. Uh, so this is, this is part of our product team, but. Um, and they could share data here. We could bring other people in. Um, I don't know if somebody wants to share data, but you, know, you, can, it's the, you guys have all seen that. Uh, some of the folks like Jeremy and Farzana are on conference room systems like I showed you that are paired. It's the exact same experience that we're seeing here. They're using a touchscreen speakerphone that also does voice to navigate in. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Rafi's really having fun. So you can add and delete as you go. He's moving to a huddle room. We work on an open floor plan. Um, but that's the idea. So with that, I'm gonna drop and come back in to a virtual meeting room and I'll ask these guys to join me because I wanna show you browser-based calling. I only have a minute and 41 left. Uh, okay guys, thanks. One of the things you saw there at the end is everybody can do everything. So I can drop myself, I can drop other people, I can end the whole call. So it's not, we have moderator controls in our virtual meeting rooms. If you wanna have a, a scheduled structured meeting with a moderator or a lecturer, you can do that and that's tightly bound. But this ad hoc dynamic calling, users are, it's, it's a user empowerment methodology and that's what people like. And the companies that buy from us tend to say, okay, it's my salespeople, it's my engineers, they're knowledge workers, I need to give them a tool set and let them run. And IT stays out of it, right, by and large. The companies that really are very hierarchical and say, you can't see you know, my VP's phone number, they tend not to be our favorite, you know, our, our happiest customers. But we're pretty clear about how we want it to work and we're really trying to make it so it's a productivity tool and a, and a, uh, a community extension tool within organizations and that's, that's what, what, what we do. So one other way in and I'll show you this is you can invite people to call you. There's a lot of different ways. This is to a virtual meeting room. You can call out of the browser. You can call in via audio on Twilio. You've got phone numbers from 57 countries here that you can dial in locally, uh, no toll in most cases. 
You can dial in via IP from a Polycom, Cisco, or other video system. You can come in from Light, Link, Skype for Business, whatever you like, or you can download our app and dial in that way. I'm going to dial in Chrome. Oh, no. Come on. It's not supposed to do that. It wouldn't be a demo if something didn't fail. You have to allow your camera. So this is just stock WebRTC. This is the, you know, our back end has hardened this, but on the front end, there's no plugins, Joining there's the nothing. Team. This is just a pure Chrome implementation of WebRTC, and I'm dialing into a virtual meeting room. And it's not, and it's taken a second to clean up, which sometimes happens. Um, but, you know, I have the same capabilities here. It's slightly different layout templates. WebRTC isn't quite as feature rich, but we really see this as where it's going, uh, where you know, users can come in either as guests or ultimately as named users and do everything that I just showed you in the browser, directories, meetings, escalation. Um, Chrome and WebRTC really open up the, the, the playing field for everybody in that sense. Um, and so that's really the next step you'll see from us in the coming weeks and months is big, big strides forward in adding functionality into the WebRTC Chrome clients. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Yeah. <laughs> All right, one other thing to show you. Thanks, guys. Uh, one other thing to show you is, you know, admins can come in and they just, as part of their account, they get reporting. They can see, you know, everything on usage. They can go in by user. They can pull up their video systems that are paired. They can go in and see how many minutes they've had. They see if they've had network condition problems. Um, they can see every call they've ever made, you know, what's happened. They can go in and, and do maintenance on devices and get into them that way, add meetings, add users. Soon we'll also have the ability to record and stream, and this is much more of a YouTube-like fluid sharing model. I'm showing you something that's not released yet, not announced yet, but what the heck, you're here. Um, and so I could, in the client, just record, which I didn't do, and then I could play back, and I could share however I like within my organization. People who were in a meeting or a call with me would get it automatically. People who weren't, I could share it with. It's much more fluid than most recording models. Um, this is one I recorded. It's pretty high quality, just to give you a sense of it. More user, and it just starts going. Um, I'm going to mute it because it's kind of goofy. That's just me in a demo site doing something for a sales event from, I think, a hotel room. Uh, but it's it's pretty powerful, and you'll see it you'll see it coming soon. So we can continue to extend onto the property very very quickly, uh, and there's other exciting new things coming soon. So. All right, with that, I think we've got two minutes for questions or three minutes for questions, something like that. So, yeah, far away. Do you support collaborative shared whiteboard? We don't yet. So, there are some web conferencing like features, like annotation or uh, passing the. Pre so, we can switch presenters. So, uh, during a call, if Rafi had been presenting and I wanted to take over and present, I could just start sharing it and say, Do you want to stop his presentation and start? We can do that. We can do, you know, point-to-point uh, -point and, and soon group chats and all that within, within calls and outside calls. But we aren't yet doing annotation or co-authoring. Those are things we're looking at. Yeah. yeah. The video recording that I just showed you is a beta. It's not yet public. It'll be public pretty soon, um, later this quarter um, or, or into early July. So it'll be recording and playback, and then in the future we'll get into live streaming. Um, that's something that, that you know, many of our customers do today is through a hybrid mode where we have a, a virtual machine instance they run on, usually on their premise, and that'll continue for customers who are very security conscious and don't want their videos at, in Amazon but want them on-prem. Um, but this is a very popular thing because you can take company meetings, training sessions, and record them and turn them into content. And the difference is, is extremely high quality, particularly from the video conferencing systems that you might put in a room. You know, you're getting, you're getting professional optics grade lenses and microphones and all those things, but it's literally a single button. So, I mean, if I wanted to record a call and I called one of these folks back, I just put, push one button and it shows up on my portal that I just showed you. So, let me just call and I'll show it to you. I just hit record and there it goes. Oh, come on. It's a beta. Joining the I told meeting. You it's a beta. I just push a button and it starts recording. There we go. So it'll, it'll keep recording and then it'll just be in my portal. And then anyone who was in this meeting with me, it would be in their portal. And anyone I wanted to share it with, I'd just shoot a link to. So that'll be an add-on to the service um, that the customers can add pretty reasonably. Uh, but we think it'll be very popular. It's been very popular in our portfolio previously. Yeah, we have a, it, it's playing, 
it's playing HTML5 natively in the browser, so you don't really need to do anything. Or it can play back to your phone. We modify for iPhone. Um, so, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, in the front. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can log in and pull that one up. So when I'm in a call, I could, let me just do it. I could just start presenting, and then I can choose what I want to show. I, if I Join have dual meeting. screens, I can, dual, I can use dual screen. Um, so if I wanted to pull up my PowerPoint, I'd pull up my PowerPoint. I have many viewers, so I can, I can do stuff with it. Um, and I'm presenting this screen, that kind of thing. If somebody else wants to take over, they can go into the app and do the same thing. And uh, they can take over. And, you know, right now I show that I'm share I see what I'm sharing. If I have two screens and I'm receiving, I can pop it out on the second screen, that kind of stuff. So pretty straightforward. Recording will record the presentation in addition. Audio, video, and data, all the parties in it. Yeah. So. Yes. See, here's the recording. It just pops up. Um, you know, we're, we're recording. There we go. Oh, see? So it'll, right. it'll keep recording, and then it'll just be in my I love it when it works. And then anyone who was in this meeting um, with me, he would be in their portal. So, you know, we, increasingly I would say we compete more against folks like BlueJeans, Zoom, Starleaf, Videxio, uh, uh, High Five, uh, and half a dozen others. I mean, you could go even further. You could say we compete with Appear.io and Room.co and every other WebRTC-based, you know, little ser you know, service that just popped up. Generally speaking, our biggest competitors tend to be, you know, really BlueJean, Zoom, Polycom. Cisco, Cisco customers tend to be fairly captive. I mean, if you're a Cisco network and switch customer and you buy, and you buy um, a Cisco call manager, they do a pretty good job of locking people down. Um, and that tends to be a fairly risk-averse crowd. So I'd say we do have many customers that use Cisco and us, but that's not our bread and butter. I mean, we, we do very well, uh, by and large, you know, outside that. Um, I didn't show the other thing is, you know, we, we do well with customers that have want link interop and the ability to do things into video conferencing, that kind of stuff, too. So it's, I mean, it's a co-opetition model. WebEx is different. I mean, you know, there, you, there's hundreds of thousands of WebEx customers, but most of them you talk to aren't really happy, so it's not too hard to show them something better. Companies like us, BlueJeans, Zoom, all day long, they're selling into customers that want something better than Global Crossing for audio or Ready to Talk for audio or WebEx or GoToMeeting. Generally speaking, because they want higher productivity, higher engagement, better video, um, and more interoperability, and that's what we provide. We extend that, though, beyond those other guys from just a meeting service into directories and call escalation and you know, connected devices to the conference room, and that's really why people choose us. Uh, in any one call today, we cap it at 40 participants, but we'll be taking that up pretty soon. Um, and then in any account, you could have another, you know, every single user in the account can simultaneously have calls as big as they want. And then you also get virtual meeting rooms that can do the same. So we sort of throw bridge resources at this. What was that? Four times Google Hangout with, with you know, the ability to do direct dialing between you, me and you, escalate calls, far better systems for the conference room. You know, there's, a lot of folks tend to start with Hangouts or Skype and then come to us from there. Yeah. So. Thank you for your time.